2007 B AP Macro FRQ number one. B 2007 B. Assume that Australia and New Zealand are trading partners. Australia's economy is currently in a recession. Now assume that Australia begins to recover from its recession. Using a correctly labeled graph for New Zealand, show the impact of Australia's rising income on each of the following. So all they're asking us for here is uh, aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So short run aggregate supply, aggregate demand. Um, what's going to happen in New Zealand? This is New Zealand up here. As Australia's incomes go up. So as Australians become um, richer, um, so their incomes or Y goes up, we would assume they're going to buy more of New Zealand's stuff. So that would imply that New Zealand's aggregate demand curve would shift to the right. Easy enough. Uh, I think we're golden there. Output in New Zealand, we can see on the bottom here, this could be Y1, this could be Y2. Uh, we can see that output has increased real GDP output, same thing. Um, all right, so increase, aggregate demand increased. We would want to explain that again, that as Australia has rising incomes, uh, they can buy more of New Zealand's things. That means New Zealand's exports would increase. As exports go up, we know aggregate demand has to go up, right? Therefore, price level and output also have to go up. Using a correctly labeled graph of the money market for New Zealand, show each of the output changes in Part A on the following. Demand for money, nominal interest rates. So, money supply, demand for money, downward sloping. Uh, it can be a straight line. Some people draw it curved. I like it straight. Do whatever makes you comfortable. Obviously, it's nominal interest rates on the vertical. College Board doesn't care whether it's straight or curved. Um, and then quantity of money on the horizontal. Now, what we know, demand for money is affected by two things. Demand for money is the amount of money that you want to have in your pocket. The demand for money is the amount of money you want in your pocket. Think about that for just a second. Um, if taco lunch, I take you to taco lunch and it's $10, how much do I have to have in my pocket to pay for taco lunch? Obviously, I need to have at least $10. My demand for money has to be at least 10 bucks to pay for taco lunch. So one thing is they can just clearly tell you that people want to have more money in their pocket for whatever reason or less money. Um, that would affect demand for money. The other thing that we want to talk about that affects demand for money is the price level. So here we are with taco lunch again. Next time I take you to taco lunch, let's say the price of taco lunch goes up to $20. What just happened to my demand for money, right? As the price level goes up, what we know is demand for money goes up. As demand for money goes up, obviously the nominal interest rate also goes up. So nominal interest rates would go up. Let's see if we can answer this. Uh, to show the effect of the output, again, we would track this to what's going on with the price level. Um, price levels go up, demand for money goes up, nominal interest rates have to go up. Um, and I think that should be fine there. I, maybe you'd want to take it back, demand for money, saying that as aggregate demand goes up, the price level would go up. As price levels go up, demand for money goes up and nominal interest rate. I think they'd know what you were doing if you just started off with that price level increasing. Because they've, yeah. Uh, and nominal interest rates we know go up. It's the explain where you get the extra point by making sure, obviously don't do arrows. Write it out. doesn't even have to be a complete sentence. But just to make sure aggregate demand increases, therefore the price level also goes up. Higher price levels mean demand would increase, driving up the nominal interest rate. And you're showing it on your graph here. So IR, IR, maybe 1 and 2. 
demand one and two if you really wanted to be pedantic. I think we're fine. Uh, assume that the price level in New Zealand, it rises. Yeah, well, we did. Given your answer to part B2, explain what happens to the real interest rate. Understand that there's two things that affect real interest rates. One is the nominal. We tend to say that when the nominal is going up, the real is, the real is also going to be pulled up. But then we also have to talk, think about the price level. If price levels go up, real interest rates go down. Bankers are now making less as prices go up. Um, bankers are making less money on their money. The real interest rate would go down. So what we have here is we have nominal, sorry, pulling the real up and price levels going up, making the real go down. So in this situation, we would just say it's indeterminate. We don't know which one is having the bigger kick. Right. So in this and I think this is the only FRQ uh, that I can remember off the top of my head where real interest rates are indeterminate. Most of the time, it's pretty clear what they're doing. So nominal interest rates, price level. Anytime they ask us to explain about real interest rates, we want to use not only nominal, but also the price level. All right. All they're recovering. Australia remains in a recession and its government takes no action. Indicate whether each of the following curves will shift to the left, shift to the right, or remain unchanged in the long run. So there's a couple of things that let us know that this is, we're going into what we talk about as a classical view understanding. Let's just draw it and talk about it. A couple things give it away. One, no fiscal or monetary policy actions, no government actions. What happens in the long run? If we see those two phrases, we tend to know that we are talking about what's going to happen in the classical view. Um, let's draw it here. And I'm going to answer it as if they're asking me to explain it, because you do need to know it. There's a lot of questions like this. We're in a recession. Uh, if we're in a recession, will people take lower wages to go back to work? Now, before you say no, which some people always seem to do, Think about this. You're out of work. You have no money and no food. Will you take lower wages to go back to work? Obviously, you will. So wages can go down. Wages and input prices tend to go down. So we could say input prices. I tend to just write wages go down, prices go down. If wages go down, how does that affect your short-run aggregate supply curve? If cost of businesses go down or input costs go down, we're going to create more stuff as costs go down. Our short-run aggregate supply curve would shift to the right. And this would take us back to full employment. Now, if wages go down, obviously business can lower their prices. When they lower their prices, output increases. Um, and we go back to full employment. So this would shift to the right. That's what they're looking for here, a rightward shift. Um, and we return to long-run equilibrium at what we can say is a higher price level. Sorry, not higher. Look at the graph, Charles. A lower price level. We can see we're at a lower price level there. All right. Um, so aggregate supply would shift to the right. I think that's what they want us to say there. But aggregate demand is unaffected, right? There's no effect to aggregate demand. It is wages and prices falling. Uh, aggregate demand would not shift. That is our classical view. All right, guys, uh, take care. Be safe.